God bless you. You can be seated. You can be seated. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about the third sermon in the series that we're in called Too Busy Not to Pray. And in this series, we've been looking at some great prayers from the Bible. The first week we looked at what I called a prayer for success. We looked at the prayer of Jabez and learned how that he prayed for his relationship with God just as much as he did for his problems that he faced. And then last week we looked at a prayer, very powerful prayer, maybe the most powerful prayer in the Bible. Uh, it was a prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. And he prayed for church unity. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. And uh, what a powerful prayer that was. Today, I'm going to preach uh, maybe an unusual title, but here's the title of the message, How to Pray at Church. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that you are to come up on stage and pray in front of everybody. That is not everybody's cup of tea. I get that. How many of you used to go to a church where they would call a deacon or an elder or someone from the congregation to come to the platform and pray. Anybody ever went to a church like that? Some of you, okay. I remember seeing those guys, and they always used flowery words. I was always impressed with that until I learned that they weren't, talk they weren't supposed to be talking to me. They were supposed to be talking to God. I remember one guy that he, we, they called him up, and he was supposed to pray over the offering. And, uh, you know, you get into these rote prayers. And if you ever say the blessing over your lunch or your supper or whatever, you can identify with this. Here he's standing in front of all these people and he bows his head to pray for the, the offering. He says, our dear heavenly father, thank you for this food that we're about to receive. And everybody just started laughing. And man, he was quick witted. He meant, I mean, the spiritual food that we're about to receive. And so, but prayer uh, how do you pray at church? It's not that. We're going to look at a psalm today that was written for the dedication of the temple. The temple in the Old Testament, that would be like the church in the New Testament. So the temple is where they went uh, to do their religious ceremonies. They went for their offerings and their sacrifices and, and, and so forth. And so this prayer was written by King David. And if you know much about his life, you know that David had a strong desire to build the temple there. They had the tabernacle, which was temporary. It was a tent. It was able to be moved, but the temple was permanent, and it was magnificent. And David wanted to build the temple, but God told him, he said, you're a man with blood on his hands. And what he meant by that is David was a great warrior, but he had killed a lot of people as a general. And uh, God said, no, your son Solomon will build the temple. And so what David did was he prepared. He gathered gold and timber and, and all the stuff that they would use to build the temple. And if you go study it and look it up, the amount of gold and et cetera, the materials that David prepared, and that's the word, prepared for Solomon was in the billions of dollars in value, billions. And so David wrote this psalm as he prepared for the temple. And it was literally sung when the temple was dedicated, okay? And so I want you to get in your mind here that David prayed this prayer about going to church. He prayed this prayer about how we're to behave what we're to ask of God when we go to church. Now, some people, when they go to church, are looking for some entertainment. Nothing wrong with being entertained. Some people are looking for a certain style of music. Some people like our style. Some people like more of what I would call a high church style. Some people like southern gospel music. I grew up in a church that was... Um, I guess the best way to describe it would be hillbilly rock music is the kind of church that we went to. It was weird, okay? Um, they had drums and they had electric guitars and bass guitars and a piano and an organ. Nothing really weird about that. But they would also have guys playing trumpets and literally, I'm not making this up, spoons. 
Now, if you can imagine what that was like, it was very entertaining, okay? But you don't go to church just to be entertained. You, you don't go to church just uh, for a program. You go to make a connection with God Almighty. And so I'm going to read to you today. I'm going to read this in three sections. And I'm going to talk about three things you say. Three ways to pray. Three things you should ask of God when you come to church. Psalm 30 verse 1. It says, I will extol you, O Lord. That means to lift him up high. For you have drawn me up. Very interesting word. I'm going to describe what it means in a minute. And you have not let my foes rejoice over me. In other words, you haven't let me be defeated. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. Oh, Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. That is an Old Testament word that refers to the grave or the place of the dead. Some people may translate it as hell, but it's referring to the grave. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Anybody ever been to the pit? I'm not talking about the pit of hell, and I'm not talking about the grave. But have you ever just had a day, and at the end of the day, you say, ain't that the pits? We used to say that when I was growing up. That may not be a popular phrase. I just, it just dawned on me as I was talking about that. Some of you may never have heard that before. That's why you're sitting there not reacting to my wonderful joke. It says, sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. And the, the verse that we just read a moment ago, for his anger is but a moment, his favor is for a lifetime, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. First thing you need to ask God when you come to church, how do we pray at church? What do we do when we come to church? How do we connect with God? First prayer is, God, lift me. Lift me. By lift, I mean to lift you out of the pits, to lift you out of depression, to lift you out of whatever it is that you got your eyes on. And we all have problems, right? I mean, life is filled with problems. Sometimes life doesn't turn out like you thought it was going to. Isn't that true? But God says he wants to lift you. That, that phrase where David said, you have drawn me up. In Hebrew, this is interesting. It pictures drawing water out of a well. You have drawn me up. That's what he's saying. Now, what does that mean? It means that God is going to wind you up. He's going to draw you up close to himself. Now, here's what I know about a well. Now, some of you probably don't have a well, the old-fashioned kind that you have to wind a bucket up and down. Anybody have that? Everybody, you just have the water that you turn on. I turn on a water faucet at our house, and water comes out, all right? But my great-grandmother, in fact, a couple of my great-grandparents, had wells that you wind up. You'd put a bucket in it, and you'd wind it up. And I, as a kid, would go and play with that. I would uh, draw water up out of a well. Here's what I know about drawing water out of a well. Remember, David said, Lord, you have drawn me up. Here's what I know. Drawing water out of a well, number one, is intentional. Number two is continual. And number three is gradual. When God says he's going to draw you up, it is going to be intentional. And not just intentional in what I ask him for, but it's intentional what I'm going through. Why? Because God wants to draw me up. Sometimes you have to go through something in order to get somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. You can't get to where you want to be without going through something. Those that run a race. Uh, this weekend we saw, some of you are into this, we saw the NFL draft. And I followed that just a little bit. Um, and, and these young men, a dream come true for them. You know what they've done? They, they wanted to be drafted. They wanted to play in the National Football League. And do you realize that to a person, every single one of those young men that were drafted this week, 
Every single one of them went through a lot. They went through two-a-day practices. They went through coaches yelling at them. They lifted weights in the off-season. They ran. They did exercises that a normal person wouldn't even think about doing. Why? Because they realized they had to go through something to get somewhere. And so God, he draws you up, but it's intentional and it's continual. Let, let, let me show you what we used to do. We would wind and wind and wind and wind. You drop that bucket down and you'd fill it with water and you'd wind and you'd wind and you'd wind. You know what it was? It was continual. You know what God does in your life? He's going to continually, if you'll let him, draw you up. Isn't that a beautiful picture? But this is also what I've learned about a well and drawing up water. It's gradual. Sometimes you ask God, lift me up, and you don't think he is, but he is. But sometimes it's gradual. Keep trusting God. So how does God lift you up when you pray that prayer, when you come to church? God, lift me. You do it through praise. He says, I will extol you. you. You focus your attention on God. You see, here's the thing about coming to church. It's not just about listening to a message. It's about a family. It's about serving. It's about being involved. And, and there's so many things that go along with being a part of the church. The Bible talks about a family. It talks about the church as a building. It talks about the church as a body. It talks about the church as a flock. In other words, you don't do it alone. You're part of something. And when you come to church, that's why, can you watch it on YouTube? Of course you can, and you can get a blessing. But let me tell you what happens. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, there's two places he dwells. He dwells in your life, in your heart when you get saved. But the Bible also teaches that he dwells in the church. Do you remember what Jesus said? Where two or three are gathered together, there will I be in the midst. Do you know why you don't get as much listening to something on a podcast or watching something on YouTube? Those are wonderful things. And I thank God for modern technology. But do you know why it's different when you come to church? Because the Spirit of God is here. And there's something that he does to you, listen, to draw you up. And that's why we come. The Bible says in the New Testament, we go to encourage one another, to spur one another on to good deeds, to lift each other. You do it through praise. You do it through restoration. He said, you restored me to life. Allowing God to lift you, to draw you, to convict you, to, to launch you to where he wants you to be. And then mostly through grace. His anger may endure for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Isn't that beautiful? God wants you to know that he wants to lift you, and it's through his grace. Weeping may endure for night, but here's the point. It's just overnight. It's just overnight. Whatever you're going through, just overnight. That's all it is. You ever have an overnight guest that you didn't really want at your house? Well, good news, it's just overnight. When our oldest daughter, Brittany, she's 33 now, but when she was 13 years old, uh, she brought a bunch. I, when I say a bunch, I have no idea how many it was uh, of her friends. They were mostly 13-year-old girls, okay? And they were at our house. And, um, you know, as a man, uh, you don't know how to handle 13-year-old girls at your house, okay? Because at one minute they're giggling and the other minute they're crying. I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't understand, all right? But she had a bunch of her friends there and they were all giggling and doing what 13-year-old girls do, I'm not sure. But uh, I was there at the house and Brittany, with all of her friends, she came up to me and they were kind of giggling, looking at me. And Brittany said, Dad, I said, yes, she said, my friends think you're weird. <laughs> and I didn't miss a beat. And I looked at her and I said, oh, baby, that's only because they're stupid. <laughs> I swear to God I said that, okay? <laughs> now, some of you are saying, I want that man's book on raising kids, all right? 
And I do have one, okay, by the way, but uh, we're just about sold out of them. Uh, but nevertheless, the point that I'm making there, those 13-year-old girls, I didn't know how to handle all of them. But you know what? It was just overnight. It, it was just for one night. And in the morning when all their parents came to pick them up, joy came in the morning. Now, those of you the kids that have hit those years, you know what I'm talking about. But can I tell you this? Your weeping, your pain, your problems, your trials, they're only overnight guests. That's all they are. And weeping may endure for the night, but thank God, joy comes in the morning. David prayed, Lord, lift me. Lift me. When you go to church, you should pray that. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us, listen, a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So what you're going through to get somewhere is worth it. It only lasts for a little while. God lift me. Whatever it is that you face, we have people come to me, I'm not kidding, every Sunday, and they tell me about how that they didn't feel like coming and God did something, they're so glad they came. Or they say something like, Pastor, I don't know, you must have been reading my email because what you said talked right to me. And I promise, I'm not reading your emails, um, but I do listen to the Holy Spirit of God. And, and don't, don't panic, okay? Some of you are thinking, oh no, does he know what I did? No, I don't, all right? Uh, and thank God, I don't want to know what you did, if that gives you any comfort, okay? But I do know this, that God lets us go through things. Sometimes it's our own choosing, okay? Sometimes you can't blame on God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, um, you know, if you do something dumb and you break your ankle, don't blame that on God, all right? It's because you shouldn't be bungee jumping at 58 years old, okay? That's all I'm saying, all right? Are you with me? But God says that he will lift you when you ask. Let's look at the second thing. Uh, verse 6 as for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Hold on a minute. You ever get fat and happy? You ever get comfortable? That's what David said. He said, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. And what happens is he's talking about complacency. Now let's read on. By your favor, O Lord, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. And that was what he was saying was, I was prosperous, and I got complacent. And then I woke up one day, and it seemed like you weren't there. Now, was God still there? Yes. But the, uh, the act of hiding your face, that was an ancient way when they talked about your face, your face lighting up. They're talking about FaceTime. FaceTime. And I'm not talking about the app that goes on your phone, right? But have you ever noticed that FaceTime is really important? FaceTime with your kids, FaceTime with your family, FaceTime with your spouse, FaceTime. Some of you have gotten used to working at home. The pandemic allowed you to work at home. Some of you do that for a couple of days a week, and then you go in the office. And that's wonderful if you like that. But I'm, I do know this. We all need FaceTime. We all need FaceTime. And he said, I was surprised. It seemed like you hid your face from me. And all he was saying was this. You know, I wasn't connecting with you like I was because I got complacent. Complacent. He said, to you, O Lord, I cry. To the Lord, I plead for mercy. And that's the good news, folks. Uh, even if it feels like you've drifted away, God is still there and he wants to have that relationship with you. All you got to do is just look at him. Look at him. And then David said, and get what he's saying here. He's saying, what point, what kind of praise can I give you if I'm dead? All right. He said, what profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? 
Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me, O Lord, be my helper. Here's the second prayer you pray when you come to church. God, use me. Use me. Now, this is a very dangerous prayer. Because when you ask God to use you, he will. And you can't be complacent if you want God to use you. You can't be lackadaisical about your relationship with God. And it's not that you have to be a super Christian. You don't. But you can't be lackadaisical about it. Many of you know, and I've told this before, uh, that when I was a younger man, I was a head men's basketball coach in college. It was a small Christian college, and it was all non-scholarship. And the pay was pitiful. Okay, I can tell you that if, if I put my pay up there with all the head coaches in the United States, I was at the bottom. I mean, it wasn't a lot, but I loved it. It was so much fun. And uh, I was about 28 years old. And uh, anyway, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And we had a team that was, was pretty good, but uh, sometimes they weren't as disciplined as they should be, but we were pretty good. And but we played this one rival. It was a Christian college. And um, they, we had never beaten them on their own home court. We'd beaten them on our home court. We'd beaten them on a neutral court. But we had never, in the history of our program, beaten them on their own home court. So anyway, we were there. And there are thousands of stand, people in the stands. And they're cheering. And they're yelling. And they're screaming at us. And I'm kind of soaking it up. And uh, anyway, it, that albatross, that millstone was around our neck. We had never won there before. And I'll never forget it. In the second half, with about 10 minutes to go, we were down by 17 points. And I was like, oh, no, this is going to be a disaster. It's going to be the same old thing. And I'm like, well, we can't get complacent. So I looked at my assistant coaches coach, whatever. We have a very small budget, so I had an assistant coach. And I'm like, we got to do something. We got to change something up. So I called timeout. Less than 10 minutes ago, down 17 points. And I said, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to put on a press. We're going to start with full court, and we're going to get some steals and make some baskets. And then we're going to go to three-quarter court. Then we're going to go half court. And then we're going to go to traps, okay? And I'm not making this up. For those of you that don't understand basketball lingo, uh, we went from 17 points down in two minutes of clock time to six points down. We scored 11 points. We cut 11 points off the lead in two minutes. And we were down by six points. Well, we uh, would get close, but we never could go ahead. It was back and forth and back and forth. And they scored with seven seconds left on the clock. We were down by two. Seven seconds left on the clock. So I, I called timeout and I told our guys, all right, here's what we're going to do. We are going to foul their giant. They had a six foot 10 center and, um, you know, he could have given Goliath a run for his money. I promise you he was a beast. Okay. But he was a horrible free throw shooter. Horrible. So I said, here's what I told our guys. I said, look, we're going to foul the giant and uh, he's going to go to the free throw line. He's going to miss both free throws and we're going to get the rebound and we're going to come down and we're going to score the winning goal. Now, did I know that was going to happen? No, but these were young people and I could lie to them. All right. So, um, so anyway, they did, they fouled the giant and he goes down once again, thousands of college students in the stand, they're cheering. And whenever, you know, the opposing team shoots, normally they scream and yell the whole time, but they're yelling. And then all of a sudden they got quiet. That's nerve wracking, especially for a giant who cannot shoot free throws. So anyway, he shoots the first free throw and he bricks it. He misses my guys to a guy. There are five guys on the court. They all turned and looked at me like, you just said that was going to happen. And I'm like, Thumbs up, you know, acting like I knew what was going on, you know. I didn't know what was going on. 
uh, I was just hoping to God that this would uh, work out. So anyway, the ref gives him the ball. He shoots the second free throw, and he bricks it. And we had the shortest guy on our team get the rebound. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is going to come true. Seven seconds, six seconds, five seconds. And I look at our point guard has the ball, and he's walking up the court. I about lost it, okay? I'm screaming at him, Mike! His name was Mike. Uh, Mike, get the ball up the court! And he starts going a little faster, four seconds, three seconds. The, the other team, they put a double team on him to try to keep him from shooting the ball or passing the ball. He steps across half court, and for some unknown reason, they got lackadaisical in their defense, and they backed off of him. Now, Mike is just calm as a cucumber, okay? And he's there three seconds, two seconds, one second. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, Mike, shoot the ball! Now, I did not cuss because I was at a Christian college, okay? Uh, but I can tell you that if somebody had written it on a piece of paper, I would have signed my name to it. I was upset. The clock was ticking down. And all of a sudden, Mike, our point guard, goes up and shoots. And the clock went off right after the ball left his hand. I don't know if you've ever been in an environment like that, but there were over 3,000 students that were in the stands. And they had been screaming and yelling and taunting up to that point. And all of a sudden, it got dead quiet. Our team was watching the ball. Their team was watching the ball. Everybody in the stands, they were watching the ball. And because these were two Christian colleges, everybody was praying, oh God, please let that ball go in if you were on our side. And oh God, please don't let that ball go in if you were on their side. And in a matter of just less than a second, we were going to find out who God loved more, all right? <laughs> the ball, it reaches its arc. You can literally hear a pin drop in the gym. Thousands of students. The ball begins its uh, descent on the way down. I'm looking and I'm praying, oh, dear God, please let this ball go. We had never beaten them before. We were down by two points. We shot a three-point shot. The ball gets closer and closer and closer. And I'm not quite sure, but I believe that I saw an angel grab the ball and put it through the net. Everybody in the gym, except for my team and our fans, everybody in the gym was like, oh my goodness, they were flabbergasted. They thought there's no way that they beat us. They never beat us before on our own home court. And I will tell you this, that somewhere on the internet, there is evidence that proves that not only is my story 100% true and accurate, but it also shows a man who would eventually become the pastor of this church dancing on their logo at half court and pointing at the crowd. Yeah, I like that. Now, that's not a very Christian thing to do, okay? But it happened, and I promise you it happened just like that. And here's my point. David said, Lord, use me. If you're going to be used by God, you can't be lackadaisical. Listen to what Proverbs 132 says. The complacency of fools will destroy them. Do not be complacent. Do not sit back and not be involved. Do not say, well, I can do that later. One of these days I'm going to get around to it. One of these days when the schedule frees up. One of these days when the kids quit playing baseball. One of these days when the uh, kids get out of school. One of these days when I retire the complacency of fools destroys them. When you come to church, what do you pray? You pray, God, lift me. You pray, God, use me. David was reminding himself that he had to serve God now. It's not appropriate to wait 
because no one is promised tomorrow. Life is fleeting. You can't waste your one and only life. See, here's what he said. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the grave? Do you get it? We pray, God lift me. God use me. And here's the final prayer. Look in verse 11. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The last thing you pray is this. God, change me. God, change me. You see, dancing is an outward expression of an inner change, of an inner experience, of an inner feeling, dancing. And there has to be change when you come to church. How do you get changed? Well, you listen to the Word of God. And not just listen, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that if you're just a hearer of the Word and not a doer of it, there's no point in that. So you hear it, but you do it. You hear it, but you respond. You listen, and you obey. God, change me. Exodus fifteen twenty. Then Miriam, the prophetess, that was the sister of Moses and Aaron. The sister of Aaron took a tambourine into her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. Don't you love that? That doesn't mean that we're going to have a tambourine section next Sunday, okay? But what I'm saying is this. Uh, ask God to change you. 2 Samuel 6, 14, I love this. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. What did David say in Psalm 30? That my glory may sing your praise. The word glory refers to David's soul. In other words, he sang God's praise with his whole being. It was rational. You think about your relationship with God. You think about what the Bible says. It's rational, but it's also emotional. Do not be afraid to express your emotions. I realize some of you are more expressive of your emotions than others. Some of you can cry at a cat commercial and uh, just feel bad all day because of the little kitty cat that you saw and that horrible song about in the eye, or whatever that is about. I'm not sure what that is. But then others of you are like me that you see that same commercial, and even though you love animals, uh, you go, uh, that's a bit much, Sarah, okay? That's a bit heavy-handed, all right? Um, but you can be emotional. Express your emotions to God. You can be physical. That's what your soul is, by the way. It's all these things. It's physical, and it's volitional, in other words, willful. So here's what it tells me, is that you can choose this. You can choose to praise God. You say, well, I don't feel like it because I was okay before we left, but the kids got in a fight in the back seat of the car, and my wife was yelling at me for not helping her. She said that uh, I'm just sitting around uh, looking at the draft while she's getting the kids ready. And uh, she was not very nice to me on the way to church. Or I'm just saying, okay, is all I'm saying. But my point is this. You can choose. You can choose to focus on God. When we come to church in God's presence, we're to pray for God to lift us, to use us, and to change us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would do that today. For everyone in the room today, I pray that you would lift them. God, lift us out of depression. Help us to get our eyes on you. Help us to realize that our problems, our pain, it's only an overnight guest. God, we pray that you'd use us. What profit is there if I go down to the grave? I can't praise you from there. I can't serve you from there. So I must be used now. And then God mostly, would you change us? Would you change us through the word of God would you change us through the power of the Holy Spirit? Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there's someone today that say, Pastor, I need change. 
And the change you need is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Then I want to encourage you to pray something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for me, and he rose from the grave. And I am giving you my life. I'm saying yes to you. I'm asking you to save me, to forgive me, and to change me. You can pray that prayer today. If you prayed that prayer in the room today, fill out the next step card and check that you pray to receive Christ. Online, make sure that you check that at the bottom of the screen today and take your next step. And Lord, I pray that you would change us today. Let us know your power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.